folly of the wise. Schiller's verbal demeanor calls to mind the young man of low origins, who, embarrassed in good society, starts shouting to make himself heard. Power and insolence mixed. German tirading and sen- sententiousness are modeled on the French, but rehearsed in the beer hall. In his limitless and implacable demands, the petty bourgeois sticks his chest out, identifying himself with a power that he does not have, outdoing it in his arrogance to the point of absolute spirit and absolute horror. Between the grandiose sublimity, sub, sublimity embracing the whole of humanity that all idealists have in common, a sublimity ever ready to trample inhumanely on anything small as mere existence, and the coarse ostentation of bourgeois men of violence, there is an intimate collusion. The dignity of spiritual giants is prone to hollow, booming laughter, exploding, smashing. When they say creation, they mean the compulsive willpower with which they puff themselves up and intimidate all questions. From the primacy of practical reason, it was always only a step to hatred of theory. Such a dynamic inheres in all idealistic movement of thought, even Hegel's immeasurable effort to remedy the dynamic with itself, fell victim to it. The attempt to deduce the world in words from a principle is the behavior of someone who would like to usurp power instead of resisting it. Schiller, accordingly, was primarily concerned with usurpers. In the classical apotheosis of the sovereignty over nature, the vulgar and inferior mirrors itself by assiduous negation. Close behind the ideal stands life. The rose sense of Elysium, much too voluble to be credited with the experience of a single rose, smell of the tobacco smoke in a magistrate's office, and the soulful moon on the backdrop was fashioned after the miserable oil lamp by whose meager light the student swats for his exam. Weakness posing as strength betrayed the thought of the allegedly rising bourgeoisie to ideology, even when the class was thundering against tyranny. In the innermost recesses of humanism, as its very soul, there rages a frantic prisoner who, as a fascist, turns the world into a prison.